So thank you all so much for joining. Um, my name is Alyssa Arvin, and I am a senior program manager for the Salesforce open source team. Like you mentioned, we're gonna be talking about how we are focusing on building uh, the open source community. Um, so here's what we're gonna be going over. We're gonna be talking about why does Salesforce care about open source? We'll talk briefly about some of the Salesforce open source projects, uh, giving back, how we encourage our employees to give back through open source, foundations and committees we're part of, and then what is next for Salesforce. So like I mentioned, my name is Alyssa Arvin, and I'm a senior program manager for the Salesforce open source programs office. I'm fairly new to the open source world, so I included my Twitter handle on here, at Alyssa Arvin. So I'd love if you would connect with me, um, would love to hear you know, what you're working on, if you're part of an OSPO or just part of the open source community and how Salesforce can help you out. I am a cat lady. I have two cats right now who are very unhappy because they are locked out of the office. So if my mic picks up any angry meowing, I'm very sorry about that. I also I'm a total cookie lover, although I would say my favorite is probably still just the basic chocolate chip. And I love to run. I did manage to get one in person half marathon in this year and then done a couple of virtual ones as well. But enough about me. Let's jump into why Salesforce cares about open source. And I'm sure if you think of all the companies who come to mind um, when you're thinking about open source, Salesforce probably isn't one of them yet, and that's okay. Uh, we, we are working on it. We're, we're trying to get the word out more because like most tech companies, open source has been a part of Salesforce's DNA from the very beginning. So we actually started with our programming language was Java, which of course we all know is open source. And it has continued to be extremely important to our company and our engineering team 20 plus years later up till today. And we realize it helps a lot with our employee experience, right? It brings in faster new hire onboarding. They already know what they're coming into work on. It cuts down on training and onboarding. It increases de developer productivity. It improves our internal processes, um, cuts down on things like legacy code and trying to figure out what is going on with that code. And it also helps with employee retention you know, our employees are working on projects they're passionate about, and it keeps them in interesting code. Um, and our open source programs office is fairly new. We've had open source forever, but having dedicated staff to actually help with the open source is something that has only been around for a couple of years. So here is one area that we're really focusing on because we're trying to make sure that our employees know that they have our support in making, contributing to, and releasing open source as a part of their day to day. And then, you know, the saying, rising tide lifts all ships. We know that investing in open source means that we all win our employees, the open source community, the individual projects, as well as our company overall. Um, so, like I mentioned, open source has been a part of Salesforce since the very beginning. But I honestly wouldn't really be surprised if you didn't realize what projects had come out of Salesforce yet. But our engineers are releasing over 100 open source projects every single year. And this includes projects like Lightning Web Component, uh, which is listed as LWC on this slide, and Oakleaf. And then we've even contributed several projects to foundations. Um, the most well-known one is probably Apache Phoenix but we also have Apache Prediction IO. And then most recently we have CNCF build packs. This year is no different. Uh, we're definitely on track to still have probably over a hundred open source projects that came out. And so I wanted to include some of them on this slide uh, because if you're not really familiar with what Salesforce has been open sourcing, these are four great ones that are all also pretty different in order for you to check out. So if you see underneath where it says cloud planning, if you see Salesforce slash cloud planning, that is half of the GitHub web address. So if you go to github.com slash Salesforce 
slash cloud explaining, uh, you'll be able to find the project. So I'll give you just a really quick blurb about each one of these projects. Just so if you are interested, you know, you know which one um, to go and check out. So cloud explaining came out of our security team and it is an AWS identity access and management security assessment tool that identifies violations of least privilege and generates a risk prioritized report. Um, AI Economist is from our research team and the foundation is a flexible, modular and composable framework to model socioeconomic behaviors and dynamics with both agents and governments. BEST is actually our newest one. We just open sourced it um, right before this conference and it allows you to write benchmarks the same way you write unit tests. This allows you to integrate BEST into your CI workflow to create a consistent picture of your code's performance over time. And then if we have any Kubernetes fans out there, generic sidecar injector, you'll definitely wanna check it out. It is a generic framework for injecting sidecars and related configuration in Kubernetes using mutating webhook admission controllers. So like I said, we have tons of projects. If you were to just go to github.com slash Salesforce, you would see all of them. But I just wanted to highlight four of them um, for you to check out if, if you haven't really seen what Salesforce is working on. So, you know, we're not just asking our employees to put out open source projects. We also want them to contribute to open source as well. And we've really been focusing on this this year um, because we want both people who are contributing for the first time as well as people who normally contribute and have it already as a part of their day-to-day -day. but we realize that sometimes people need a boost in order to contribute for the first time and others need a reminder because we all know you can get caught up in your day-to-day -day job and you just kind of get out of the habit or forget to check in on open source so as we were thinking about, you know, how we can make sure that we're continuing to get people to contribute and, and just think of open source as part of their day-to-day, -day, uh, we came up with this plan to encourage our employees to give back or volunteer through open source. The reason we did this is because giving back is huge to Salesforce. Um, so this, the numbers on this slide are, this is for giving back in general. Um, but, you know, in over 20 years, we've had something called the 111 pledge, which gives 1% of the company's time, equity, and product to nonprofits. So if you see on here, uh, employees have given over 4.5 million volunteer hours, and we're encouraged to donate 56 hours per year of our time to nonprofits. So, you know, we're thinking of how do we make sure people are continuing to focus on open source? And then also we're always trying to make sure that we're hitting the goal of volunteer time off. And so we thought there's gotta be some way that we can combine this, right? So we came up with what we call um, volunteer time off, or if you hear me say VTO, events that are focused on humanitarian free and open source projects. So we're holding quarterly events. Um, we've done two so far and we have one next week. And the, uh, first one we did was focus around projects that were helping with COVID relief and hospitals. And then the second one was focused on um, our employee resource groups. So we normally started off with a tech talk from one of our open source contributors um, and we record it in case people aren't able to join it live. And then we block off three hours for our employees to use towards giving back. Um, and here we suggest four projects that they can contribute to. They don't have to use those four, uh, but we choose four that we know have a welcoming community and that have good first issue tags. So we'll make sure that we're really sharing the fact that it is good for newcomers. So if people are using open source but they've never given back to open source, they know that this is like a good project to start with. Another really cool thing about this is it can be done completely remote. Um, so, you know, we are a global company, but we've always kind of run into this issue where our events have been focused at HQ, um, which is San Francisco for us. So when Josh and I were coming up with this program, we wanted to make sure that it didn't matter where you are, you can participate in this event. So even though we might have the three hours blocked 
and it might not be the appropriate time for your time zone. All we ask is that you just block off three hours. So someone in Singapore can still work on this event. It might just be a different time that someone in San Francisco is doing it. And it's been really successful. You know, we wanted to hit 500 hours for the year. And like I mentioned, we've only done two events so far. And we've already had over 350 hours of volunteering towards the open source project. So if you're interested in setting it up at your company, um, or even if you're just interested in doing it on your own, we did put out a blog uh, with more information. And the link is here. But if you also go to engineering.salesforce.com, if you just search just pledge 1%, it will um, pop up for you. So it has more information on open source as a way to give back, as well as step-by-step -step instructions on how to host an event at your own company. And of course, you know, it doesn't just stop with those two areas. We also want to make sure that we are financially supporting open source as well. So we do have foundations and committees that Salesforce is part of. And we break it down into four main areas, which are listed here. And I just, <clears throat> excuse me, I just listed a few things. This is definitely not a full list of the things that Salesforce is involved in. But you can see here, like these are the three projects that we are financially supporting, um, you know, whether it be monthly or giving one large donation towards them. But we also have something called a FOSS fund. And that is a framework for giving back to the open source community where your company decides to give a dedicated amount to fund a specific open source project. And how, <clears throat> how you determine that amount is actually your open source contributors are telling you through a nomination and voting. So if you're interested in learning more, about what a FOSS fund is. I'm actually giving a talk tomorrow with Jade Applegate from Indeed, and it's at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. So we'll dig into why you should start a FOSS fund at your company and how you do that. We also sponsor a ton of open source events. So we have a few of them listed here. And you can see it goes all the way from community events like Open Source Mexico to language specific events like GopherCon and PyCon to larger conferences, um, such as, of course, all things open, here we are, and we'll be at KubeCon next month as well. Uh, we're part of foundations, of course, the To Do Group, Click Group, Apache Software Foundation. Again, there's a few others that we're part of, but I just wanted to call out three here. And finally, we support standards bodies. Um, we actually, in January, I believe it was, held a TC39 meeting at Salesforce, so we try to, you know, provide different ways to give support. Uh, we just, you know, we really realize how uh, important it is for us to continue to support open source, both financially and through our employees contributing to open source. We know that Salesforce relies heavily on open source. And so we want to make sure that we're really doing our part uh, to make sure the projects and communities remain strong as well. I mentioned at the beginning that the Salesforce also is fairly new. Um, so we have two dedicated staff members, which is Josh Simmons, who's on the call, and myself. And so we know, you know, we're just very beginning stages of this. And we're just starting to scratch the surface of everything that Salesforce can do in order to make sure that we are really supporting the community. Um, so we have a lot of things coming out with through the end of this year, next year, long-term planning. Uh, but I just want to point out two things to keep an eye out. We're going to be open sourcing our marketing documentation. So I actually created these two docs and originally it was just going to be for our employees. It was how to name your open source project and then how to market your open source project. Because um, these were things that employees kept coming and asking us for help on, and we wanted to make sure that everyone had access to this. And, you know, we realized that we were getting really positive feedback from our employees around it, and we just realized this is something that could benefit everyone. Um, so we're going to be open sourcing all of these docs, <clears throat> probably end of year, beginning of January. Um, so if you follow us on Twitter, which is at Salesforce End, you'll be able to see when these are released. We also launched something called an accidental maintainer series. Um, and we just did a moderated chat about it right before this at uh, 
11 a.m. And so, you know, it's focusing on the fact that we know most open source project maintainers become maintainers because they solved a problem and they want to share that solution. But like rarely do maintainers anticipate the ongoing commitment and additional skills that are required to cultivate a healthy project and community. You know, this can be things like cultural competence, um, community management, even marketing, how we're, we're open source of our marketing, uh, the technical writing, the documents you have to put out. So we're starting to put together different themes that we'll be talking about. And the cool thing is, is it's not, not our company coming and saying, hey, this is how you do it. We're actually interviewing different projects and uh, people in the community to ask them, how did you do this? So our Action for Maintainer series on governance is already out. And we talked to Django, Python, and cloud explaining. And it was really cool to see how the different projects viewed governance when they were first setting it up, how they viewed it in the middle, and then how they view it now and, and kind of how it changed throughout and they adapted. Um, so that was a really cool series. I definitely re recommend checking it out. We will also, our next topic is inclusive communities. Um, and then we'll be talking about transferring to a foundation, surviving the maintainer's exit and gracefully deprecating a project. So this area, with everything we're doing, we obviously want to partner with good people, um, hear any suggestions that you have, I, with, especially with the Accidental Maintainer series, um, you know, we, we want to know how you as a maintainer, what you need in order to be successful. So if you're looking at this and you're like, oh, when I became a maintainer, I struggled with X or, you know, I had to learn Y the hard way, let us know. We'd love to hear what that is um, because most likely if you have been struggling with it or you had to learn it the hard way, other people also are as well. So follow us on Twitter at Salesforce Eng. Um, and you know, we'd love to connect with you there and see what ways that we can partner and, and what you have for thoughts. Um, but I have some resources on here as well. So we have our open source website and our GitHub are probably the two main things you know, that you'll wanna check out. And then, like I said, our Salesforce engineering Twitter and my personal Twitter as well. So I made this presentation short on purpose because since Salesforce is also so new, you know, we wanted to give you a heads up of what we're working on, but we really wanted to take this time also to chat with you and see how we can better support you or ideas that you've done at your own OSPOs that have really worked well. I'd love to open it up to questions now. Um, you can either put them in the chat and, you know, like they said, make sure you're putting them public. Um, or if I believe if you raise your hand, we, we can also unmute you. Um, so at this point, I have not seen any, if there's any questions in there yet. So let me pull that up. Um, no questions in there yet. No questions in there yet. Awesome. Well, what do you guys want to hear from? We'd love to, to chat with you. And I have Josh on the phone as well. Um, yeah. Hi, Josh. Thank you. Hi. Nice to be here. Oh, awesome. I just saw someone posted um, that Timber Mill is another open source project that you may be interested in. So thank you. Yes, definitely Timber Mill. And uh, oh, sorry, Josh posted that. And then um, Josh also included in the link to our accidental maintainer, um, the governance series. So definitely check that out if you are um, a new maintainer, a maintainer, or thinking about open sourcing a project. While we, while we give folks a, a moment to uh, drop some questions into the chat, I will I want to underscore one of the things that Alyssa spoke to in her in her presentation that you know the the OSPO the Open Source Programs Office at Salesforce is is definitely new, um, but like any like any tech company, open source has been a part of what we do from the from the beginning, as she mentioned. Just just choosing the language Java for starters. Um, but what's been so cool, you know, I'm new to Salesforce in the last couple of years here. Um, and like Alyssa alluded to at the beginning, I did not think of Salesforce when I thought about open source and companies that contribute to open source. And so when I heard that Salesforce was hiring uh, dedicated staff for it, I jumped at the opportunity because 
well, here's a company that doesn't have, uh, you know, a, a, an established reputation in this area yet, but it's a major company. And that seems to me like a huge opportunity. So uh, I was delightfully surprised when I finally started uh, a couple of years ago. And I realized that, you know, not only is there like Java and there's, you know, the, ex the standard, like, okay, yes, we're running a lot of machines that are running on, on Linux and, you know, there's Kubernetes and there's open source up and down the stack, like you totally expect. What I didn't expect uh, was just how much open source software Salesforce had already been releasing and had already transferred to foundations. Uh, I was uh, one of my previous employers, uh, they, they had released an open source project, they had contributed to uh, a foundation, the Apache Software Foundation, and they were ecstatic when that project finally graduated to be a full, out of the incubator to be a full Apache Software Foundation project. And they should be, that's a huge accomplishment for anybody to get to that point. Uh, but then I come to Salesforce and I find out that Salesforce has two projects that have been contributed to the Apache Software Foundation and already made it out of the incubator. So, you know, I'm really excited to, to be here at All Things Open, to be talking a little more about what Salesforce is doing in, in open source. Um, yes, this session is a little bit navel gazily, uh, you know, a little bit of navel gazing, looking at like what we're doing. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're putting out a lot of content, a lot of things around All Things Open because we don't wanna be focused on ourselves. The whole point of open source is, you know, there's this, this massive community that we're all participating in and benefiting from. And we wanna we want to share how we're giving back to that and hopefully encourage some other companies who are in our space to do the same. That's, that's really the biggest impact we're looking to have. Like, yes, we wanna support communities. We wanna hear from you, uh, the ways we can better support you. But really if Salesforce can just add a little more weight to like, well, this is what a company should be doing in open source to give back. Um, that's, that's a win in our book because we, we wanna see, uh, you know, we're following in the footsteps of, of other companies who been giving back a lot and let's just uh, let's just keep that rolling and with that I see we have a question now yeah I Brian I'm not able to click on the if I click on it nothing happens I can't pull up what the question oh, is I can I can it's it's from uh, Troy Curtis asks uh, what kinds of qualities do you look for when selecting your recommended projects for the one percent uh, pledge one percent you had mentioned the community should be welcoming, but what other things are you looking for? Um, do you have any examples of um, some some uh, past projects possibly that mm -hmm. you could recommend? Yeah, um, so when we're looking at it, like we said, we wanna make sure, okay, so we wanna make sure that they have um, issues that are open. So we look for good first issue tags, we even look for documentation tags because we want to get our technical writers more involved in open source. Um, but we want to make sure that first of all, there's things that people can contribute to and that it's active. Uh, that's one thing we kind of found in the beginning was we were finding these projects that looked awesome, but they definitely were not active projects anymore. Um, they didn't have any issues open. There just wasn't a lot of activity happening on it. Uh, once we have that, we check to make sure that they have documentation on how to get set up, how to do it. Um, code of conduct is actually one we didn't look for our first round, but was a recommendation from one of our employees. Um, you know, make sure that the projects have a code of conduct. Um, and then we'll reach out to the project maintainers just to let them know, you know, some projects, they might get one pull request, but others might get 20 plus. And so we wanna make sure that they're aware that we're doing it and that they're set up to receive the pull request coming in um, and we're not overwhelming them. And so, you know, we, we give them the opportunity to say, oh, this is not a great time for us right now. Um, and that's totally fine. You know, we, we wanna make sure that we're definitely not harming any of the projects by doing this volunteer event. Um, so those are the main ways. We also come up with themes. So we try to, we do that just to try and keep things like focused and have different themes throughout. And then people, you know, if they weren't as interested in like the COVID relief, but then they had strong ties to an employee resource group, then they can jump into that one. Um, so those are the main things that we look for. Um, did I miss anything there, Josh? Anything else that we're taking into account? 
No, I think you really covered our bases. The, the uh, good for issue tags, guidance on how to get started, uh, code of conduct, um, regular activity. Those are all things that we look mm -hmm. for to make sure that it's going to be a good first experience for, for uh, our staff. Um, the second part of that question was, you know, are there specific examples of, of projects? Um, and just a, just a couple. So as Alyssa mentioned, the first, the first time we, we held an event like this, uh, it was really at the, the very early stages of the pandemic here in, in the United States. And so we focused the, the projects we recommended on that. And I've granted every time we run these events, we give people the opportunity to pick any project they like, but we want to, uh, we do pick a theme because we do want to keep it focused and we want to you know, make it easy for people who maybe don't know where to start. Uh, and so in that first event, we did really tackle things that were specific to the pandemic or somehow related to it. Uh, so one of those was uh, the project Next Strain, uh, which has been used to uh, sort of like, it's like an open science project uh, where people are tracking the genome of, of COVID-19 as it evolves in, in around the world, uh, which has helped for contact tracing and also helped with the efforts to synthesize therapeutics and, and drugs to uh, address the issue. But we didn't just look at the, the research side of things because we know that everybody's got like a slightly different interest and might want to engage with the subject in a different way. So we also looked at uh, a hospital run, a hospital run being a project that is used to uh, support hospitals in developing, uh, developing countries. Uh, we also worked on, I believe it was uh, uh, Apia, um, Maybe it wasn't obvious, but we had a distance learning project, right? Because in amid the pandemic, you know, we, we need to do a lot more distance learning. Um, the fourth one, I can't remember. Uh, so that was our, our Ushahidi, first. Ushahidi, I think. That's right, Ushahidi, uh, which is a which is a major, fantastic project that was spun up in the wake of the Haiti earthquake, I believe. Uh, that is really focused on uh, disaster response uh, and coordination, um, and you know, there's often a lot of information or misinformation when, when people are trying to coordinate disaster response on the ground in the wake of these events. So that was our focus for the first event. Our second one, as Alyssa mentioned, was focused on our employee resource groups, uh, or we, we call, also call them our equality groups. So these are the groups who are representing, for instance, uh, uh, Black people and people of color who work at the company, or people with disabilities, uh, people who are part of the LGBTQIA plus community. And so we picked projects that aligned with uh, support of those communities. Uh, for instance, we picked one called Rebuild Black Businesses, uh, which is really about looking at Black businesses who had been uh, impacted in the wake of the pandemic and, um, and sort of the, the political unrest that we have here in the US right now. Really looking at businesses that have been impacted negatively and, and crowdsourcing ways to support them. Uh, for Ability Force, our, our, our disability community, uh, we picked ACTS, uh, which is a, a popular project for uh, doing testing, accessibility testing, and we use it heavily internally at Salesforce. So really every, every time we pick a theme, pick a set of projects that we think will speak to a few different types of interests. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then we see, see where people go from there. Yeah, and I think the volunteer events have been something that has surprised me the most with this. When Josh and I started, we, we didn't really know if people were going to be interested in this or not. And like I said, we've already had 350 hours. Um, and we were just like, okay, let's, let's try and hit 500, you know, this year. And the cool thing is, um, I've had people email me from all over the world and say, oh, I can't attend the three hours that you blocked off. Uh, but can I do another time? And I'm like, yeah, this is something you can do anytime. Um, and at Salesforce, we always log our hours. So I just tell them, I'm like, make sure to log your hours. We have an open source contributors uh, event, I guess, that's open all the time that they just go and log the day and how many hours. So that's been really cool to see, like even outside of the events, people are continuing to circle back to this and contribute to it throughout the year. Um, so we've had you know, this one person, and I, I want to say they're in Singapore. Um, they're definitely not in the U.S. I'm pretty sure they're in Singapore. And he has been contributing um, almost every month 
at this point. And he'll just do a couple hours at a time. But, you know, that right there is awesome because he's giving back. He's also continuing to contribute to open source, which is one of our mine and Josh's goals for the year is how do we get people to make it a part of their everyday job. So that's definitely that that's been one project that I, I think has honestly been my favorite this year because it totally surprised me on the success that we've had with it. Um, and we will we're planning to continue to open source a lot of our documentation. So right now we just have the blog out. Um, but it could be something you know we can look into to open source more information about that. So then every quarter when we select new projects, we can put it in there and you can check out you know which ones are coming up this quarter and see if you want to do it alongside us um, when we're doing it internally. I'll add just one little, uh, one more thing to the conversation around our, our volunteer events. Uh, you know, the goal for us is to, uh, as Alyssa mentioned at the start, to get open source contribution to be a part of sort of the day-to-day -day workflow for people. Um, and that's only true for a, a maybe 15% uh, people who work in our tech org right now. And we, we want to we do way better than that. Um, and what we realize is that for a lot of people, even if they've been in their, in their role as a, as a developer or a technical writer for, um, you know, for a decade or more, they still may not have had an opportunity to contribute to open source. And in fact, open source might still be a bit of a black box for them. You know, maybe they know they use a lot of open source tools, but they never contributed back. So they just don't know what that experience is like. Uh, so what we do is we use these events, not just as like, yes, we're volunteering and that's, that's good in its own right. Uh, but we're also, we're trying to use that volunteering experience uh, as a way to get people to make that first contribution because that first one is always the hardest. Uh, if only because of the psychological barrier that's there because it's the first time somebody is doing something. And so by picking different themes each quarter in different sets of projects, which use different sets of uh, different technology stacks, you know, we, we get an opportunity to, you know, over the course of the year, we're going to hit on at least one or two projects that a person is interested in contributing to. Um, and of course, we we hang out in, in Slack or online while people are, are doing it during the uh, designated time. And we're, we're always available to help people who have those questions and need a little handholding along the way. And I just put the um, link to the blog in the chat as well. It had linked to it in there, but um, just so you guys all have it. But are there any other questions? Um, yeah, I've like got, yeah, I've got one. I just, okay. uh, so do, do you have plans? I know you mentioned the lightning web components and are there plans to kind of continue that effort like in the, the main code going forward with, with new features and functions? Could you repeat that just uh, once more? It, it, is there, I know you, you mentioned that, you know, you've, you've uh, introduced open source to um, a lot of your new features and functions like the lightning components. Um, are, are there plans to kind of continue that going forward with, with new features and releases? Yes. So the idea behind lightning web components, um, you know, Salesforce is, is not new technology, right? And uh, the interface that it had previously, I think we, we called that the Aura framework, which was also open source. Um, uh, you know, we, the, the, the front end interface or the framework that we use to build on top of the Salesforce platform uh, so has been open source for, I think Aura was 2014, 2015. It's not, it's not that old. Um, so the big idea behind open sourcing the, the front end frameworks uh, that we use on our software uh, was that anybody who's developing in the Salesforce ecosystem, because there's, there's a huge ecosystem of, of software built just on top of Salesforce. Um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to help people who are already doing that uh, by releasing a framework, uh, releasing the framework that we're using so that they can use it in their other applications that are sort of built in this product ecosystem. Um, 
you know, people use Lightning Web Components to work on other interfaces. That's that's icing on the cake. Uh, but definitely, we've we've open sourced it because we see it as part of encouraging sort of the ecosystem development around Salesforce. And I think you'll see that as a, a a strategy going forward. You know, it's something we, I think we started dabbling in with the release of Aura, and we're we're really just getting that dialed in to figure out how we can best encourage the the growth of a an open source ecosystem around those tools. Um, so we're 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 still sort of figuring it out. Uh, Lightning Web Components was a was a huge uh, a huge improvement over Aura, being that it's you know standards based based on web components. Uh, I expect you'll see more of that going forward from us because we we realize that it's not just useful for building out an ecosystem, uh, but really like the reason people come to Salesforce and pay us money is is not because of you know that that software. It's because of the whole thing that we operationalize. So as much of the the top of the stack as we can open source as possible to make life easier on people, you know we're we're going to be doing that. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. And as a user of the lightning, the lightning components daily, um, no, I'm very impressed. Yes, oh, I'm so <laughs> pleased to hear that. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to use it, my, to deploy it myself, so I'm, I'm pleased to hear some uh, a testimonial there. Our, uh, we also have a Salesforce.org arm of Salesforce, which is focused on um, nonprofits, and they are. Josh, do you remember when they're speaking? Because they're actually talking about how. They have they have something called Open Source Commons, and that is for all of our non anyone has access to it. But our nonprofits use it a lot because they realize, okay, if we set up, you know, Salesforce this way for this one specific food bank, it's actually going to work for all of the food banks um, to some extent. So they have really focused on using open source uh, to benefit our nonprofits. So they're speaking. I think Josh is looking for their time. Um, and it's two people from Salesforce, and then they have a customer talking about it as well. So that could be really interesting to see, you know, kind of how Salesforce is really using open source within our product. 